Let's turn back to the basic problem of the Enlightenment that I was talking about, this picture of a scientific conception of the world, a scientific conception that doesn't by itself make any room for ought or should or just or unjust. The question is then how those would be understood in terms of that scientific picture. Are they something in addition? Are they in some way disguised ways of describing the world? Um, are they things that don't, in their own terms, make any sense at all? It's not clear exactly what we're supposed to do. Well, we could think that that Enlightenment picture, therefore, threatens at least to undermine morality. We've got the job of explaining how shoulds and oughts and rights and wrongs can fit into that basic picture. Now, some Enlightenment thinkers, such as David Hume, think it can't really be done. But others approach morality and politics by saying, actually, they're very much like uh, science in the following respect. They can uncover universal and absolute laws of, in this case, morality, of politics, of justice, of other things that we could take as expressing moral <coughs> ideas. How can you do it? Well, their idea is to rest things on rationality. How can we fit those norms into the basic Enlightenment picture? Well, that's a picture that stresses truth, it stresses reason, and so we could use perhaps reason and say, look, the idea is to base those other norms on rationality. Maybe right and wrong, justice and injustice, in the end are all about rationality and irrationality. So that's their idea. If acting rationally increases our chances of getting what we want, well, we ought to act rationally. And so all of this is a way of saying morality and politics stem ultimately from self-interest. It's a question of just trying to do what's reasonable. And so, what is it to behave reasonably? Well, it turns out it's to behave morally. And in particular, it is to submit yourself to a government. So here's the basic idea behind what is known as social contract theory. The thought is that what makes government authority legitimate is that we would voluntarily and rationally choose to put ourselves under its authority. Now, Notice that government authority is a very powerful thing. The government has the right to tax you, has the right to imprison you, may even put you to death, may require you to fight wars. It can infringe your liberty, your property, and indeed your life in a variety of ways. So it's an extremely potent authority. What makes it legitimate? The thought here is, well, this makes it legitimate. I would, if given the choice, voluntarily and reasonably submit to its authority. So the central idea is that government and its authority are really rational. And many of these thinkers extend the same line of reasoning then to morality as well. But let's focus just on the political situation. The idea is to contrast the state of government, submission to the authority of government, with the state of nature. The state of nature is here understood as just a condition without government. Okay, a circumstance where there is no government authority, there is no government power. So it's really just a state of anarchy. We don't have to think of the state of nature as, here we are in the jungle. Okay, you're alone in the jungle. <laughs> Here's a tiger on that side, you know, a wolf on that side. Are there places in the world where there are both wolves and tigers? <laughs> Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, anyway. <laughs> that's like, you know, you can think of it that way, but you don't have to think of it that way. The idea is just, what would it be like if there were no government at all? The name for that state is the state of nature. Which would you choose? Well, it depends what it would be like to be in the state of nature. What if there were no government? What if tomorrow, for example, the US government, the state government, the local government, all shut down? Actually, there's been talk of a government shutdown. Suppose the federal government did shut down. And the state of Texas said, hey, they don't have to pay our people. We won't pay our people either. Screw it. <laughs> and then the city of Austin, actually, it just got so confused. Nobody showed up. <laughs> but in any case, suppose there were just no government authority at all. What would it be like? All right. He says, awesome. <laughs> Why awesome? You could do it. Yeah, keep an Austin weird, right? You could do whatever you wanted. <laughs> so that's one conception. This would be fantastic. But what are some other possibilities? Yeah. I think it would be kind of cool at first, and then kind of just degrade down to chaos as time went on. Ooh, cool at first, but then it would degrade down into chaos. What kind of chaos? What might happen? There'd be no loss, and people would just be doing whatever they please. Oh, okay, right. yes. Uh, here, one typically, one. I show Unfair people trade. a clip from The Simpsons. <laughs> Springfield's Do What You Feel Festival. <laughs> a welcome replacement for our Do As We Say Festival, started by German settlers in 1946. <laughs> uh, and anyway, it does devolve into chaos. Yeah? There would be no source of revenue since people would be 
people can essentially just start stealing anything they want. Like in like if you go to a store, you could just steal whatever you want, and there would be no. The store wouldn't get Ooh. open, and there would be no morality. Oh, what if, if there would be perhaps no morality? People would just steal anything, right? There'd be no police, nobody to call. Yeah. Governments like cartels and stuff. Ah, good. People might form new governments, might form cartels. We could just think, wait, anything would happen. You know, you go to the HEB and you think, I could pay for this soda, but why should I do it? Right? Nobody's going to catch me, so you run out of the store. Now, you might think, is HEB just going to sit around and say, oh, yeah, just take our stuff? No. I think, no. What are they going to do? They're going to hire people to stand at the doors and make sure you don't steal their stuff, right? And in neighborhoods, you might think, there will be no police. But what will people do? They will band together and hire security guards and stuff like that. So in short, it's not entirely clear what would happen. Would it be chaos? Would people do a pretty good job of protecting themselves? I mean, probably the closest we have in the real world to this is what happens in war-torn countries where the government really does not control the territory. Or in the Old West, let's say, when settlers moved into an area and no government had yet been organized. So we have little glimpses of this. In any case, there are different conceptions of what would happen. The originator of social contract theory is Thomas Hobbes. And he gives one of the most famous characterizations of this. He was born prematurely in 1588 when his mother heard of the, the approach of the Spanish Armada. Fear and I were born twins, he said. <laughs> and that does capture his idea of what the state of nature would be like. Famously says, it would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, life in the state of nature, that is. <laughs> Somebody reacted to this by saying, huh. That describes one of my former boyfriends. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the idea is you would, if given a choice, voluntarily form a government. You would submit to the authority of government. Why? It's better than the alternative. The alternative would be chaos. It would be people stealing, people killing. It would just be a war of all against all, he says. And the reason for that is that we're all roughly <coughs> equal in ability. Now, not exactly in a equal in ability. Some of us are stronger than others, can run faster than others, are smarter than others, and so on. But he says all of those are within pretty narrow bounds, really. Uh, and so suppose there is one person. Let's say one person in this Hobbesian state of nature starts dominating this classroom, going around and stealing your lunch money. Suppose it devolves back into middle school, okay? <laughs> Does, is that person so powerful, so strong, so smart, so fast, that there's nothing anybody else can do. We all just have to submit. Suppose it's Roy Flukinger. Roy comes around and says, give me your lunch money. Do we all just have to say, oh, Roy, yes, I'll do it. <laughs> Is there anything the rest of us could do? Yeah, what can we do? Gang up on him, right? Yeah, I mean, he might be stronger than any one person, but maybe a bunch of us leap him <laughs> at once, and we can we can get our way. So the thought would be... Not if I'm hungry enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's pretty but in any case, the idea would be, look, we're equal enough that people can band together and outsmart or outwit or outplay or <laughs> out... Maneuver. Maneuver, yes, other people. So that leads to an equality of hope. Everybody thinks they've got a chance. However, he says, look, there really isn't enough to go around. Is there just enough stuff in the world for everybody to have everything they want? No. And so conflicts are inevitable, and so he thinks this will inevitably lead to a war of everyone against everyone. And that produces a condition of total poverty, of insecurity. To escape all of that, we would agree to form a government. So the basic picture, here's the contract. I give up a certain amount of my liberty, exactly how much is debatable, but in any case, I gain security. I am in such danger in the state of nature, I'm willing to trade some liberty for security. And that would be a reasonable thing for me to do. So he says there are some basic natural laws that would govern my behavior in the state of nature. And by natural laws here, he doesn't mean decrees of God. He doesn't mean things imposed on us from the outside. He just means things it would be reasonable for us to do. First thing, seek peace. Second thing, defend yourself. And third thing, surrender some liberty for peace. Make that trade of liberty for security. Keeping only as much liberty as you'd allow others against yourself. So that's his idea. I would be willing to trade some liberty in order to gain peace, in order to gain security. And that would be a reasonable thing for me to do. So rules we have about not only obeying government and submitting to government authority, but also moral rules of a certain kind, say, look, don't injure others, do not steal, do not kill, and so on. 
Those really come from this. I will give up my liberty to kill, since I don't want you to have the liberty to kill me. I'll give up my liberty to steal, because I don't want you to have the liberty to steal from me. And so on. Well, that's one conception. His idea of basing political authority on a hypothetical agreement, it would be rational if I were faced with this choice. And thus on the rationality of living under authority inspires two different models of the social contract that continue to battle each other today. One of those is what I'm going to describe as a bottom-up model in John Locke. The idea is that it's individual people who have rights, who have interests, and they give some of those up to the government, and so the government gets whatever authority it has from the people, from the consent of the government. Okay, in that sense, it's bottom-up. Authority flows from the people up to the government. The other conception is what I'm going to call a top-down model in Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and it's the model that, in the end, there really are no rights until people form a government, and then the government grants people rights. So rights and, in general, authority flow from the top down. Let's take a brief look at each of those. John Locke has the idea that rationality does justify government, as Hobbes thinks, but it also limits its authority. I am going to be willing to give up a certain amount of liberty to gain something. As we'll see, it's not exactly security in Locke, though it's something like security. But I'm going to do that in a very limited way. I'm going to insist that the authority that I create and submit myself to be answerable to me. So his solution is to say, let's look more carefully at that state of nature. Is it really just a war of all against all? Life there is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short? He says, no. In fact, initially, it's a situation where, OK, nobody has political authority over everyone else. People are equal by right and by jurisdiction. This is what inspires the inalienable truth that all men are created equal. The thought is people are created equal, not in the sense that we're all equally tall, or equally handsome, or equally smart, or fast, or strong, or any of that, but in the sense that nobody is a natural ruler. There was an earlier conception that some people are just born to be masters, and other people are born to be slaves. And Locke is saying, no, in the state of nature, there are no natural relations of authority. Nobody has a right to command anybody else. We're all fully equal in that sense. He says, it is a condition of liberty, but not of license. And what he means here is that you can't just do anything you want, even in the state of nature. There are things that are moral and things that are immoral in the state of nature itself. And in particular, there is a law of nature which says that no one shall harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So even in the state of nature, even in Austin, under that circumstance we were describing where there is no government authority at all, it would be wrong for me to kill you. It would be wrong for me to steal from you. It would be wrong for me to punch you and in that way damage your health. It would be wrong for me to kidnap you or imprison you or enslave you. And so in all of those respects, he says, there is a moral law that exists even in the state of nature. I'm not free to do anything I want. Moreover, since I would have rights to life, health, liberty, and property in the state of nature itself, and I would have a right of self-preservation, it means I would have the right to execute the law of nature. What he means is I would have a right to enforce the law. Suppose we're there in the state of nature and somebody comes and tries to steal something of mine. Do I have to just let him do it? No, I can try to preserve myself, not only protect my life and my health, but also my property. And so he says, I can fight off the attacker. I can try to preserve myself, I can defend myself, and I can enforce the law of nature. Suppose I see, see someone stealing from you. I can stop them. And so all of that, he thinks, is part of the state of nature, too. That means it wouldn't be a state of war. It would not be a conflict of all against all. Why? Basically because we would form posses. We would form vigilante groups. We would hire security guards. We would do things to form those cartels you mentioned to try to protect ourselves. Well, how would that work out? Suppose we did that. Suppose we said, yeah, forget the police. Um, suppose there were no police. We just all hire security guards or bodyguards. You know, I come to class and there's a big bodyguard standing here to protect me. <laughs> oh. I, I wouldn't need one. <laughs> I would not be one, you know. So, well, yeah, never mind. <laughs> but, but yeah, suppose it were like that. 
And in some ways, that's what the Old West was like, right? Before there were organized territories, settlers would come, they would start settling a given area. Suppose somebody, cattle rustlers came in and took their cattle, what would they do? Just sit there and say, oh, well, life is solitary, poor, nasty, British, and short, what are you going to do? <laughs> no, right? They'd form a posse, they would try to track those people down. Many Western movies are really built around this kind of premise. They would take care of themselves. Well, is that good? What's the disadvantage of just having posses, vigilante groups, private security guards, tough guys, things like that? Then you kind of create a map, like a map, someone's in charge. That way. Ah, okay, yes, you're creating a situation where um, some people are sort of temporarily in charge, right? Suppose something goes wrong, you set up this vigilante group, they're going to try to track down another Simpson reference, the Springfield Cat Burglar, great episode for looking at the consequences of vigilante groups, Homer Simpson ends up leading one. Uh, yeah, what are the disadvantages of having Homer Simpson in charge of a posse? <laughs> yeah? You're not really, like, you're not really on the same level of intelligence like Homer, Homer Simpson. Like, so you'll probably think, like, oh, well, I'm probably smarter, I should probably leave, and there's no source of, like, really, like, a set of democracy into it. It's just, do as you please, these people are... These people are leaders, in a sense, but there's not one person that's in charge of it. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, these people now become in charge of enforcing the law, but wait, why should we trust them? Maybe, like Homer, they're stupid and lazy. <laughs> um, or maybe they've got other kinds of problems, right? As Lisa later in that episode asks, if, Dad, if you're the police, who will police the police? He said, well, I don't know, Coast Guard. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a serious problem, right? Who looks after that? Who makes sure they're doing sensible things? What other disadvantages are there? Yeah? It's hard to define justice when so many different people are ruling small groups since they have their uh, individual views and morality, and therefore there will be more conflict. Ah, good. People have different views of morality. People have different views of justice. And actually, it's worse than just the fact that people disagree about these issues. Who is going to be tracking you down, let's say, if you've taken something? Batman, yeah, maybe Batman, <laughs> maybe Homer Simpson, but maybe, right, the person you stole it from and his buddies. Now, they catch you and accuse you of committing the crime. They say, hey, I see you with some cattle there, uh, so I think you took his cattle. And you say, no, no, this is the school mascot, this is Bebo, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Look, you're standing next to that cow. We have reason to suspect you. You're in trouble, right? And now who's going to be judging you? The very people who have been wronged. And so Locke says there's a great danger here of what he refers to as the passionate heats. What does he mean, the passionate heats? The people who are going to be judged, jury, executioner, police, and so on, will be those people who have a stake in the outcome. And that's a pretty dangerous situation to be in. Somebody's been robbed. They're understandably angry. They go track someone down. They find you. They accuse you of the crime. Do you have any reason to believe they're going to be fair to you, either in judgment or in punishment? No. And so Locke says, look, we're in real trouble here. The problem is really finding an impartial arbitrator. Who can we have to be judged? We want somebody whose interests are not at stake to be police and judge and jury. And so I would be willing, he says, to give up my right to execute or enforce the law of nature in order to gain impartial judgment. It might be all fine and dandy as long as I'm the one hi hiring the security guard, as long as I'm in charge of the posse. But the moment I'm not, and I get accused unjustly, I'm in deep trouble in that sort of system. So would it be a war of all against all? No. It would be more like the Old West, where it's very easy for injustices to occur because we can't guarantee impartiality in the process. So. For that reason, we would be willing to give up some of our rights, but notice not that many. Why? Because we are doing this precisely to protect our rights to life, health, liberty, and property. And so am I going to be willing to give them up? No, I'll limit them a little bit. I will agree to pay taxes. I will agree to submit myself to the judgment of government if I am found by an impartial judge to have done something wrong. But I will not actually just give up all my rights. The other top-down conception is in Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He writes the discourse on the origin of inequality and then on the social contract, the first describing the problem of inequality as he sees it, and the second providing the solution. According to Rousseau, all rights issue from the state. 
All rights are given top down. There are no rights at all in the state of nature. I actually enter into the social contract in order to gain certain rights. Those rights come from the state. His picture is also that when I do this, I actually change my social arrangements, I change my institutions in such a way that human nature itself changes. So, here's the basic idea. Initially, we've got this image of the noble savage. All my needs are satisfied. I'm there by the stream. If I get hungry, there are deer in the stream. I can shoot one of the deer and eat it. Um, apples grow in the trees, and I can just eat the apples. Um, I'm thirsty, I just roll over and drink from the stream, etc. All my needs are satisfied in the state of nature. But then people start competing. There's a certain amount of natural inequality. They get mean. His picture of the state of nature quickly devolves into something like the middle school cafeteria. And he says, well, then we would establish some rules, as Locke says, and all that would work for a while. But, he says, as soon as metallurgy and agriculture enter the scene, we're in trouble. Why? Because as long as we're hunters and gatherers, inequality is bounded. I might be better at hunting or at gathering than you, but look, there are limits to what I can do, and I can't really accumulate a lot of stuff or it'll just rot. However, things change as soon as private property enters the scene. And so he says, the true founder of civil society is the first person to enclose a plot of land, say, this is mine, and find people fooled enough to believe him. We mentioned that when we were talking about Marx. His idea is that it's the key to great inequality. We end up in a situation where a few are gorging themselves on luxuries while the multitude lack necessities. And so, he says, not only do we find a situation of great injustice and inequality, but also, he says, human nature itself gets corrupted. We start trying to deceive people into thinking we're one of the masters rather than one of the slaves. And so, the idea is you've got to try to appear to something you really are not. His solution is the social contract. It starts this way. Man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains. He says, in the social contract, we surrender everything, but we get everything back. What does it mean, we surrender everything? We give, our, give ourselves wholly over to the enterprises of the state, but then it gives us back our fair share of the fruits of cooperation. And so in that way, I commit myself completely to the state, but it gives me back not only actually my fair share, but it makes it my property, it makes it my right. And so what was before mere possession becomes now a right. Well, on that conception, the state has absolute power. It is in control of all the rights. It may grant individuals rights, but it's up to the state to grant or not to grant them. All rights and all liberties, all equality, all security ultimately derive from the state. And so that's why I describe it as a top-down picture. You surrender everything to the community, and the community decides what's of use to it, and allows you to keep the rest. So we've got a contrast here between a bottom-up model, where some rights are natural and independent of government. The government gets its power from the rights that individuals rationally and reasonably and voluntarily consign to it. And these are rights, really, that other people not mess with me. The top-down model is very different. All the rights flow from the government. All of them are civil rights, depending on the government. Um, the rights of individuals derive from government. And those rights can be, in some cases, positive. That is to say, other people actually have an obligation to do things for me, not merely to leave me alone. All right, well, that's all really background. In the end, this becomes, <laughs> you might say, it, the debate takes the form of understanding a concept in Kant that inspires many later thinkers. He talks about one fundamental principle of morality, and in particular, a concept that becomes known as the concept of the kingdom of ends. A rational being must regard himself always as legislative in a realm or a kingdom of ends, he says. Now, what on earth does this mean? Well, the kingdom of ends is a situation where everybody treats everyone else with respect, obeys the moral law. And he says, what do I mean by this realm or kingdom? Well, the systematic union of different rational beings through common laws. But what is this systematic union? What is this respect for other beings? Is it merely that I leave them alone? That accords nicely with Locke's bottom-up picture. Or is it one where I actually take on their ends and we all share the same ends, the ends of the state? That's Rousseau's top-down picture. In Kant, I think it's just unclear what he means. But his term for this is Reich, the Reichsverschwecker, of the realm of ends. And on one conception, that just means, hey, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, it'll all be good. On another conception, it means 
we must all share the same ends, we must all commit ourselves to the state, you, you want the good for me, I want the good for you, we all want the good for each other. And so, <laughs> so yeah, it can mean very different things to different people. Now, 